I fear for inflation. I fear the political ramifications. And I'm very concerned that the central banks are really not taking it seriously enough, calling it transitory. Joining us for a conversation is Andrew Heck, a world-renowned commodities trader and analyst with over 40 years experience. Mr. Heck, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much, Maurice. It's a pleasure to join you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on the program to discuss battery metals and companies that may present unique value propositions to shareholders. Before we begin, Mr. Heck, please tell us about yourself. Well, I started my illustrious career in commodities at the age of 16 when I was lucky enough to get a summer job at what was the world's leading merchant commodities company. At the time, it was called Philip Brothers, which became Solomon Brothers, which became Citigroup. And my job as a high school and college uh, student was to deliver telex messages to the traders and traffic people. Um, who uh, bought and sold and, and transported raw materials around the world. And I was very, I, I became very interested. I, I would read every telex message and kind of uh, uh, got very excited about the business. It, it's a very exciting business. Every day is different. Uh, they traded every commodity from crude oil to gold, from dried mosquitoes to bauxite to just, they, they really covered everything where they, they had offices around the world, their headquarters were in New York City, but they, um, where they didn't have an office, they had an agent. Uh, so they really had the world covered. And when I graduated college, they uh, offered me a job in the traffic department and I uh, rose up uh, to eventually run a number of businesses for them. I ran their global precious metals business. I ran the sugar business there. I ran uh, the Moscow office for a brief time. I spent five years in London for the company. I ran the nickel business. So I had a pretty good education there. I worked there from 1976 to 1998. And then afterwards I worked for a number of hedge funds, banks, consultants, and I began, began writing, I guess, you know, for a number of uh, uh, sites and uh, teaching, I guess about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, that's who I am. <laughs> well, good enough. And we've had uh, we're, we've had the pleasure of having some of your work on our website. And we brought you on today actually to discuss your latest musing, which covers copper and lithium entitled Location, 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 applies to the quest for battery metals, where you compare real estate to commodity production and the importance of location. Walk us through the importance of location in the mining space, sir. Well, we'll start with, with the, the, the term that anyone who's bought a property and talked to a real estate agent knows location, location, location is everything when you buy real estate. But, you know, commodity it, commodities are interesting because production is, occurs in very localized areas where the, 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 the crust of the earth is rich in minerals or metals or energy or where the soil is arable uh, and, and can be, and crops can be produced. So, you know, they, they, you have to be, it, it, there's only certain areas of the world where commodities can be produced. And, you know, there, there are a variety of them, but the jurisdictions are very important because there's a big difference between investing you know, Mark Twain once said that, that uh, what did he say about uh, uh, gold mining? He said that um, a, uh, a, the definition of a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing in front of it. Uh, <laughs> I've, so, heard, I've heard of that one. <laughs> so, I mean, a great comment, a great, great uh, comment. But, but the, the point is you're investing tremendous amounts of money in a mining project and jurisdiction is critical. You know, there's a big difference between a mining project in, you know, Africa or in, in uh, South America in, where, where the political situation is not all that stable. We, we've seen it in Indonesia, you know, um, uh, with uh, Freeport Mac Moran's project, uh, the, the, that, the copper mine there. Um, you know, we've seen those situations where government or, or corruption can get involved and, uh, you know, producing commodities in democracies where there is the rule, strict attention to the rule of law uh, are, are premium places to produce compared to, to, to many other places. You know, the, the, the U.S. has the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Business Practices Act, uh, that basically U.S. companies can't pay off foreign 
governments um, uh, for favors. And, you know, that's legislating morality. I'm not making a political statement on this, but that just happens to be different than in some countries. <laughs> where that's required to do a mining project. And we've seen many I instances. So when I compare it to when I, you know, going back to the question, location, 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 it's all about mining jurisdiction and where you're going to have the easiest path, easiest path to extract these minerals and metals from the crust of the earth. Now, speaking of location, what are some of the top jurisdictions for mining? Well, look, you know, it, it goes to it, it, it's it's a two two part answer. First of all, you have to have the reserves. <laughs> That's critical. The reserves have to be there. So, you know, the, the world's biggest producer of copper is Chile. And Chile has been a very um, successful copper producer. But in terms of new production, and now with the bull market in, in a lot of these metals and all commodities, really, uh, producers are scouring the earth looking for new deposits. And positive, you know, good jurisdictions in democratic countries where, they, where there's attention to the rule of law uh, are premium. So I live here in the beautiful silver state of Nevada, uh, which happens to be uh, a very mining friendly jurisdiction has been for a long time. Look, during the gold rush, you know, California gets the spotlight, but Nevada was a, was a big uh, source. That's why it's called the Silver State. So, you know, Nevada is a very, very uh, great um, uh, mining uh, uh, state. I think the Fraser Institute called it one of the best jurisdictions in the world uh, for for copper. Um, you know, there are places in South America that are still very good places to mine. That, but, but as you go down the chain of corruption, you know, some places <laughs> are very difficult. Understandable. Multi-layered question. Given the jur jurisdictional uh, risk here, you mentioned BHP is talking with Ivanhoe Mines regarding their DRC assets. Why would BHP look at DRC, which is one of the highest risk jurisdictions, is it safe to say that demand for battery metals such as copper and lithium has created a future supply shortage with few future projects in the pipeline, especially in prime jurisdictions? Absolutely. So so a couple of things. First of all, Ivanhoe Mines, I think that's uh, Robert Freeland's mine. Yes. He's yes, a great is. operator and he's a great salesman. And I'm sure that, you know, he did a lot of work to get BHP very interested in Ivanhoe because he's a great promoter. Very interesting character, certainly. Anyone who read uh, Steve Job, Walter Isaacson's biography on Steve Jobs, he's uh, he was one of Steve Jobs' friends. Did you know that? Yes, he shared a story yeah. with us uh, uh, during the Sprott Symposium, if I'm not mistaken, about how a, the name Apple great, came about. <laughs> I have great stories about Robert Friedland. Actually, I met him in the 1980s, and uh, I had a meeting with him in a sauna. How's that? <laughs> but anyway, going back to the question. Ivanhoe Mines, this property in the DRC, the DRC is plagued with problems. Glencore had tremendous problems and is facing uh, Department of uh, uh, Justice, uh, all kinds of problems in the US, the UK, with, uh, you know, dealing with the government there and payoffs and all kinds of stuff. But BHP is and other producing companies are starving for new production. When it comes to copper, it takes eight to 10 years, Maurice, to get a new mine into production and based on you know the, the 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 move towards addressing climate change in the world copper you know goldman sachs called it the new oil uh, the decarbonization mm -hmm. does not happen without copper i mean you know in evs and wind turbines and all these things demand is going up tremendously it's going up a lot faster than supply can keep pace and Mining companies are starving for production. So, you know, I think that uh, BHP, the world's probably the world's biggest uh, miner by market cap, is holding their nose and looking at a project in the DRC. I'm sure they're not thrilled about it. I'm sure they'd like to have it in a, in a better jurisdiction. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a licensed representative of Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments, which is the only online precious metals dealer that is licensed and bonded. Let me say that again, the only online precious metals dealer that is licensed and bonded to offer you physical delivery of gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium, as well as offshore depository accounts with Brinks and precious metal IRAs. Give me a call at 855-505-1900 
or you may email maurice at milesfranklin.com. Now, back to the interview. Absolutely. Now, keeping with the demand story for lithium and copper, we're seeing a lot of M&A in the space, such as Lithium America's 400 million bid for Millennium. What does this mean for other companies in the space? And you mentioned Noram Lithium based in Nevada as an example. Yeah, so I look at this as, you know, as an investment case. All right. So so Noram, the last I looked, they have like a $50 million market cap and they're in a really pretty interesting kind of area that's uh, in, in, in Nevada that that is pretty promising in terms of what, you know, what what they're going to be able to produce in terms of lithium if um, Albemarle's uh, uh, production, which is the virtually next door, uh, is any sign. So at a $50 million market cap, you know, let, let's just go back a minute. Exploration companies, they're not like lotto tickets per se, but they're, they're, they offer tremendous exponential returns when they hit. So if you have a $50 million market cap and you're, you know, searching for lithium, you're exploring for it and you hit, you know, then here comes an established producer who's, who would love to take that production off your hands, like um, LAC, like Lithium America's corporation is doing with Millennial at $400 million. I just look at $400 million. I look at a $50 million market cap and I say, hey, this thing has eight to- at least eight times upside if they, you know, produce. And, and look, my mining companies, even the biggest mining companies, tend to outperform the commodities they produce when the markets rally and underperform when they dip, when they correct to the downside. So they provide some leverage, which is nice because, you know, they kind of turbocharge, you know, your, your view of the commodities. The exploration companies are on steroids in terms of what they can uh, uh, produce in terms of, of earnings for investors who get in early. So that's how I look at, at, at you know, this kind of Noram uh, versus Millennial versus uh, uh, Lithium America's situation. Does that, does that make sense? It certainly does. Now, sticking with Nevada, you mentioned Nevada Copper is another example that has positioned itself to take advantage of the grown battery metals and EV demand. Can you expand on your thesis for the demand for the red metal? Oh, yeah. Well, look, <clears throat> as I said before, Goldman Sachs calls copper the new oil. Goldman Sachs projects, forecasts that the price of copper will rise to, to $15,000 a ton by 2025 bank of america i think that they're higher uh, i've seen some forecasts up to twenty thousand dollars a ton at fifteen thousand dollars a ton copper futures on comex are about six dollars and 85 cents a pound right now they're trading at i'll just look at my chart here if i may be so bold uh 445. that's a huge percentage increase and a company like nevada copper which has the Pumpkin Hollow project in Nevada that's, you know, that's really making great strides uh, towards um, um, sustained production. This is, this is a, 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 in a very friendly mining jurisdiction, this company, and with, you know, proven and probable reserves. And uh, it can only provide exponential returns if copper is going to go up. You know, the, 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 the management of this company you know, it's been conservative. Their their estimates are at copper prices that are much lower than Goldman yeah. Sachs' forecast. <laughs> if Goldman Sachs is right and the others are right. And the other thing, Maurice, that's very important to know about commodities, and I've been trading commodities for the better part for more than 40 years now to, to date myself. Um, commodity prices tend to go, when they go higher, they tend to go a lot higher than even the most bullish analysts forecast they tend to go lower also than bearish uh, forecasts in bear markets look at lumber for example the lumber price went from 250 dollars per thousand uh, uh board feet in in uh march 2020 to over 1700 dollars in a in a bullish frenzy this is possible. We've seen coal prices explode. We've seen many, many. It's kind of like a bullish relay race in commodities right now. As of November the 12th, uh, the commodities that have the bullish torch that are carrying the bullish torch, wheat, 
Uh, coffee, which made a new high this morning on Friday, November 12th at, at over uh, $2.20 a pound. And copper's been right in there. In May, copper went to an all-time high at nearly four ninety a pound. So I expect, you know, the forecasts by an fundamental analysts are all well and good. But when you put market sentiment into it, which is what really drives prices, a bullish frenzy can drive them much higher than even the uh, the most bullish analysts uh, forecast. And that's why they tend to take the stairs up and an elevator shaft down during correct. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, sir. When do you see an end to the battery metals bull market running? Well, look, that's the timing is is everything in markets, and the bull market will not be a straight line. They rarely move in straight lines. And as a matter of fact, bull market corrections or sell-offs can be absolutely brutal. We just saw coal fall from $280 down to $130 a ton. That's thermal coal for delivery in Rotterdam. And, you know, we saw copper go to 490 and fall down below $4. And now it's back at the midpoint of the range. So I see a lot of volatility. The, you know, the, the, the addressing climate change is a multi-decade situation. There, 1% of the cars on the road in the United States today are EVs. If we boost that to 30, 40, 50%, the demand for battery metals is going to continue to soar. And it's gonna be a real challenge for producers to keep pace with that demand. So I see this as a long-term secular bull market with a very bumpy roller coaster like ride because they are commodities and commodities are far more volatile than other assets. Well, switching gears, sir, before we close, sir, what keeps you up at night that we don't know about? Oh, that's a great <laughs> You know, I'm pretty concerned, Maurice, about inflation and hyperinflation. You know, Jack Dorsey really recently said that hyperinflation is on the horizon. Hyperinflation is a real problem. I look at, you know, we're talking about commodities. I look at wheat prices. You know, if you ask most people, what the most political commodity in the world, what do you think they'd say? Crude oil, right? Yes. Yeah, because crude oil comes from the Middle East. But I, I'm a student of history, and I know that throughout history, the most political commodity is wheat. Wheat, or, or the ability for people to eat bread, mm -hmm. uh, has, has toppled more governments than any other commodity. Look back to the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette lost her head because of rising uh, bread prices. The, the latest example is the Arab Spring in the early 2010s when bread riots in Tunisia and mm -hmm. bread riots in Egypt led to uh, a, a, sw a, a sweeping chain, political change across North Africa and the Middle East. And now we're seeing wheat prices go to the highest price since 2012. I fear for inflation. I fear the political ramifications. And I'm very concerned that the central banks are really not taking it seriously enough, calling it transitory. So right now, that's what's keeping me up at night. Um, I, I think inflation is a real worry, and I think that political leaders are discounting it for their own political agendas. That's certainly very concerning. Last question, sir. What did I forget to ask? <laughs> I think we covered a lot of space. Um, I, I would I would say that uh, I, I write prolifically and my work can be found on a number of websites. I write every day. I have articles out every day. I'm on Seeking Alpha at least once or twice a week. Uh, I'm on bar charts every day on a different topic, every weekday that is. Uh, I'm on um, investment.com uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I have a Monday night call with my partner, Todd Horowitz, that, uh, you know, you can go to BubbaTrading.com and, and sign up for where we go through each market uh, step by step. But I think to, to answer your question, the one thing, you know, the primary thing that drives commodity prices and, and, and you know, I, I'll tell a little story. When I first started my career as a commodities trader, my first boss said to me <clears throat> something that seemed kind of like a truism but it's very it's a very important lesson and it was that markets go higher 
when buyers are more aggressive than sellers and they go lower when sellers are more aggressive than buyers. Market sentiment is the most important thing uh, uh, for, for price action. So following the herd, while I do a lot of fundamental work, the most important thing I follow is sentiment. Sentiment is critical because it drives prices. And, you know, trend following is very, very critical. So, you know, while I have a very, I call my, my um, method of following markets a technical method, which combines technicals and fundamentals, but I put technicals first because sentiment is so critical. Understood. Mr. Heck, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, sir. Wishing you the absolute best, sir. Thank you so much, Maurice. A pleasure to be with you. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.